Hi, I'm Vito de Smetona. It's nice to be back. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit today about what's new, uh, musically speaking, concerts, compositions. Now, this is an interesting thing because sometimes people ask you, what, what performer or what composer really had a tremendous influence on you or you really admire? Well, certainly, I admire Brahms as a composer uh, for many reasons. Not that he's a great composer, but he was also philosophically someone who kind of held the onslaught of uh, contemporary music at bay. But um, what may not be generally known is that he actually recorded two pieces of music. One was uh, his own abridged version of his G minor Hungarian dance, the first Hungarian dance. And the second one was, a, a, I guess, a mazurka polka of, uh, of Johann Strauss, which was literally Gebrauch music. It was, it was dance music, meant none for ballroom dancing. So no, he didn't record the Goldberg Variations. He recorded that in a lighthearted gesture. But uh, the, the Brahms piece, I'd like to just illustrate a bit to you because I think it, it was probably the most striking performance of anything I've ever heard in my life. And it brings me back to uh, something that Arthur Schnabel wrote about that in his uh, series of talks at the University of Chicago given the 40s, I believe called Reflections on Music. And he talked about some of the musicians he had contact with in the 1880s in, uh, in Vienna, Austria, among others were Arthur Rubinstein, Anton Rubinstein, and of course Brahms. And he said that uh, when Brahms played, he, I believe, heard him play, he was, maybe Schnabel was 11, 12 years old, he played the uh, Brahms piano quintet in G minor, he played the piano part. He said, not only did the great music make a tremendous impression on me, but the creative vitality and the wonderful carefreeness of his playing affected him as well. So what I'd like to do is this. Brahms recorded this excerpt in 1889. It's out there. By that time, he had written his four symphonies, the two piano concerti, the uh, D minor, all three violin sonatas. He had not written yet the great uh, G major uh, string sextet, the great uh, clarinet quintet, opus 115, piano pieces, opus 116, 17, 18, and 19. But he was certainly a musician who was of a level of Beethoven. So it's an incredible historical document. So what I'd like to do is first, he had, uh, he wrote them as four hand arrangements. And it tells you something, I was remarkably successful and it made him, uh, it was a pecuniary, a, a very great success and people bought this and played it in their homes. That's how music was transmitted then and cultural level I think was very much different. But uh, he made orchestral arrangements of a number of them and a number of them he arranged for one piano, two hands. And this was G minor he did. Now, he did not play the one hand arrangement. It sounds like he took the orchestral arrangement and kind of reduced it for the piano. Anyway, what I'd like to do is just play the excerpt that he played and kind of a standard type of a performance. And then I'm gonna play it like he played and then try to emulate his performance. So here we go. Okay, standard performance. Now, when Brahms played it, it was literally like a hand came off the printed page, grabbed you and said, listen to me. It was uh, very striking. It was tremendous freedom and elan. Um, freedom, not license, not vandalism, freedom. Rhythmic freedom, elasticity of expression, and tremendous fire. Sounded something like this. Let me try it. I kid you not, listen to it. It was, 
incredible. And, and what I think is so significant about that, uh, the whole idea of recreative art, performance, interpretation, how can you possibly look at that Frisca section and that that syncopation should be so huge that it literally grabs you? Um, what's interesting is like you, you'd raise the question, okay, who, who could have been influenced by that? And I'd say Schnabel. Um, one thing which struck me about his treatment of syncopated sforzandi chords was the great Schubert D major sonata, the third movement. So he's got, there's, it's, it's in 3-4 time, there's a big sforzando on beat one, on beat three, which is tied over, syncopated, there's another sforzando, and Schnabel makes, it sounds like Brahms almost when he plays that, so let me just play that excerpt, let me play it the way a standard performance, typical performance, which, you know, acceptable, and then the Schnabel way. Okay, Schnabel. Same thing, it's almost the music jumps off the page and grabs you. Uh, so what's been going on? I've uh, spent more and more time in composition. I recently completed my fantasy and it was just recorded. It'll be part of a new CD and there's also a video version of it. Um, what's the music like? Well, it's a lot different than what you might have heard, country song and capriccio. It's heavy, dark, uh, minor key, uh, passionate outbursts, uh, harmonic language again does not stray beyond Brahms. It uh, has a large fugue, uh, polyphonic and contrapuntal writing. Um, what were my influences? Well, I'd say there were three. Obviously there was Bach, <laughs> but the other three were the uh, Prelude to Tristan and Isolde by Wagner, and the influence was in the sense of this concept of organic growth. Um, there was the second movement from the Schubert posthumous A major piano sonata, and the influence there was just, the, the again, this is very general, it's not specific, but the idea of this uh, freedom, inspiration, and imagination, these bold strokes of the pen that came off of the printed page. And then, of course, there was Mozart, uh, I was thinking of this great C minor fantasy. Um, you know, my fantasy is a lot different, but uh, the, what I took away from Mozart and all of his creation was uh, his version of transformation of themes. You know, a great deal is made of this, that, you know, Schubert started it with a Wanderer fantasy and then Liszt and the Sonata and then the light motifs of Wagner. Listen, this transformation of themes is as old as music. I mean, think of the Beethoven Fifth Symphony, uh, the relation between the main theme and, and the... Uh, uh, third movement, uh, the main theme of the first movement, and then there's a sub subsidiary team of uh, third movement, even a little bit in the fourth movement. But um, uh, anyway, those were the general influences, and uh, maybe I can just illustrate what I mean. Um, the great Mozart E minor piano sonata, you know, this one goes like this. There's that second theme, which you think he pulls out of the thin air. How are these related? Very interesting. If you listen to the transition material in the first theme. Definitely what he does. And then he goes down. Anyway, that type of a, of a motivic fragmentation of development, that uh, made a very strong impression on me. Um, and then the other thing would be the way, um, when you look at the Bach preludes and fugues and his Art of the Fugue, fugue um, 
One of the things that struck me as a unifying feature is how he ties together the episodes. So I, when I had my fugue, I wanted to make sure that the material was tied in. Now, you know, you could talk about all of these things till you're blue in the face, but ultimately, if, if you don't have inspiration, it's like, it's just nothing there. So hopefully there is some inspiration and you enjoy the music. It's going to be up on the internet shortly. Um, last thing I just wanted to mention um, is a, a new work I put in my repertoire. It's the Brahms F minor piano sonata. Uh, to me, it's a remarkable piece of music. Alfred Cortot described the second movement as the uh, greatest love song ever written. And uh, what Brahms did, I think he was about 20 or 21 when he wrote his three sonatas. Uh, the first two are workmanlike efforts, but I don't think they would have put him in the Hall of Fame. But the third one was just a complete masterpiece. And what was the difference? Well, inspiration, brilliant ideas, brilliant treatment. Uh, when you hear it, it just etched in your mind. It's, it's an incredibly beautiful work, and I'm, I'm very glad that that'll be in the repertoire. So what else is going on? I started writing a piano sonata. And there's an introduction, and then I hope that the entire work is based on one bar introduction. With tw I'm sorry, there's an introduction. The main theme is based on a one bar, 12 notes. And sometimes I take out notes and leave a skeleton. Sometimes I just pick certain notes. But these are some of the technical devices, which again, without inspiration, they're worth nothing. But uh, I have started working on that. Um, I have a canonic variations and fugue for string quintet, which is essentially done. I thought the fugue was a little weak, and I'm going to be working on expanded. Hope to get it done this summer. Uh, the uh, New York recital is up and running, and it should be on the internet as well. They're my last recital at the Demena Center, and I'll leave you with a, an interesting thought about problems you can run into performance. I, I think in a live performance, I, I definitely feel there's a kind of an adrenaline and a inspiration which typically it's difficult to replicate in a recording studio but you can also run into issues so what you're going to hear on there is totally live unedited it's real um, I remember one time I was uh, performing and I came on it looked like the piano hadn't been used in 20 years uh, I was assured it would be tuned and I, I looked at the keys they're really dirty and I said well you know I can clean no don't worry we'll take care of it so about half an hour before the recital, I come up just to do a final warm-up, and I look at the keys, and they are just filthy. And uh, I was about to uh, grab a handkerchief out, wet it, and clean it off when the stage manager came, and he was horrified, like, what are you doing? You can't do that. Uh, I love unions, but apparently I was violating union protocol. So a union member had to come and clean the keys. And I, I think this is something he may never have ever done. So he took out a rag that looked like it had some kind of product on, like, you know, furniture polish. And I'm going, oh my goodness. He takes it, <laughs> goes over the keys, and I'm going, what am I going to do if I say anything? They'll cancel the concert. So when I came out, I had a, my first selection was something which was rather delicate. And, uh, uh, the keys are just slippery like you wouldn't believe. And I thought, how am I going to make it through this? So I did, and, and luckily I was sweating and nervous. And uh, every time I would take and wipe down my, my fingers, and after a while I think the product was removed <laughs> by virtue of my playing. But you never know what you're going to get. Anyway, uh, thanks for being with me. Stay tuned for more. I'm Vito de Smetona.